Hello everyone, we're getting ready to look up today with a brand new Uplook video with an enriching top 10 list. You can like the video, subscribe, and ring the bell to make sure you don't miss out on any of our future videos. Today's topic, the top 10 reasons Christians don't witness, and why we should. Often, what we call reasons for not doing something for the Lord is either a misunderstanding or a weak excuse. There's a lion in the street, we say, and we snuggle into our lazy boy. But the issues are way too big and the consequences way too serious to get this one wrong. Someone you will meet today desperately needs to meet your Savior. So let's get this straight. Reason number one, they don't know we're supposed to witness. That's for sure. You know, when we think about what a witness is, it's not a prosecutor, it's not an attorney, it's not a judge. It's simply telling people what I know, right? It's uh, Christ is my Savior and the simple way of salvation. That's it. I don't have to be able to argue. I'm there simply to present the information that I know through faith. So, you know, when we think about witnesses, we're not talking about evangelists. There are some people who are specially skilled to equip us so we can share the gospel. According to Ephesians 4, that's their role. But when we look at Acts chapter 8, for example, we read those who were scattered abroad went everywhere evangelizing the word. That's the word that's used there. That's in verse 4. But when we look back to verse 1, we discover this isn't the apostles. These aren't the people who were given the Great Commission. The apostles all stayed in Jerusalem. It was everybody else who was scattered abroad. And so all the believers, as they went out in their daily interaction with people, they told people, you know, the most amazing thing that ever happened to me and the most amazing person I ever met is Jesus. And through this, the gospel rapidly spread through the ancient world. Reason number two, because older Christians around them haven't given them a good example. That may often be true, but it's not a good reason still, because if you don't have any good examples, then be one. Now, Timothy was a young man, but he was told to be an example. And quite frankly, I'm not sure how we can stay silent about these things, right? We're talking about the world's greatest friend, Jesus, we're talking about the world's greatest need, salvation. We're talking about the world's greatest offer, the gospel. And we're talking about the greatest event in our lives, our own personal conversion. So whether we have good examples or not, it seems to me we can't help it. We've got to share this wonderful news. Reason number three, because they say everybody already knows the gospel. The fact of the matter is it's just not true. We've overestimated how good we've been at sharing the gospel. For example, if you ask yourself the question, how many times has somebody witnessed to me? How many times has someone offered me a gospel tract? It's pretty rare. And so, no, we have not overdone this. It's been my experience that in contacting people, they have this sort of fuzzy general idea. They may know some of the historic events of Jesus dying and rising again, but they have no idea why. They have no idea how that impinges on their lives. And unfortunately, in many churches, they mix up the gospel with baptism and church attendance, uh, membership, all sorts of things, so that people get this muddled idea about what it means to be a Christian. And the great thing about the gospel is, in the Word of God, it's so clear and concise, and we can share it just in a sentence. Reason number four, because no one is interested. Again, just not true. Millions of people today will hear earth-shattering news. You've got terminal cancer. I'm sorry I don't love you. I'm leaving. You've lost your job. Jesus came for the brokenhearted, and so there's no end of a mission field if we care about people and the heartaches of their lives and the offer that we can make to them. Now, sometimes people will say to us, 
when we initiate a conversation about spiritual things and they'll say, I'm not interested. And I like to ask them, not interested in what? What do you think it is I'm asking you? What is it I'm offering you? A lot of times they think I'm trying to get them to switch holy clubs to leave their church and come to my church because very often that's been the approach that people have taken. But to say to people, you're not interested in peace, not interested in certain hope beyond death, not interested in unconditional love, the secret of true happiness, you're not interested in those things. That's what we're talking about. That's what we're offering to people. So I think sometimes when people say they're not interested, we need to clarify what is it that they're not interested in? Because I think if we can communicate the gospel the way the Bible does, uh, they actually will be interested. Reason number five, procrastination. You know, and this is one of the problems that if we delay telling our workmates or our neighbors the gospel, we have other interactions with them and then years go by maybe, then we feel sheepish like, you know, they're going to say to us, well, you knew this like years ago when you first met me and you never told me this. And the best approach then is just to be honest and say, you know what? I valued your friendship. I was afraid it might interfere in our friendship, and that's why I kept my mouth shut. But I shouldn't have done it. I should have told you this right off. And I think the Lord can overcome that problem, and we can find the answer. But the fact is you can never do a good thing too soon because you never know how soon it'll be too late. And most of us have stories of opportunities we had, we let them slip, and then the person died and we missed out on it. So we really need to get on this project right away. Time's ticking. We don't know from one day to the next what will happen. So we need to buy up the opportunities when we have them. Reason number six, because sinful or worldly habits have shut our mouths. The Apostle Paul in 2 Corinthians chapter 4 he talks about this. He says, if our gospel is hidden, it's hidden to those who are lost. And the devil is in the business of trying to blind the minds of people so that they don't see the gospel. But if we're hiding the gospel light, well, then we're doing the devil's work. He can take a vacation because we're doing it for him. And we don't want to be involved in that. So when we think about this this issue of hiding the gospel, one of the reasons is when we're not walking with the Lord. And the devil says, you can't talk to anybody. You're not being obedient to the Lord as it is. David, in his penitential Psalm 32, he says, when I kept silent, my bones grew old through my groaning all day long. And Paul says to the Philippians, you know, make sure that your lifestyle suits the gospel. If you go out ready to witness for the Lord, it'll save you from a lot of traps. You're going to be walking circumspectly. If you're ready to witness, you're not going to, you know, say things or do things that will undermine the gospel. The way you drive your car, you cut somebody off in traffic, you may meet them in the line at the grocery store. And so you're thinking that way and you're not going to be flirting. You're not going to be selfish, you're going to be thinking about opportunities for the gospel, it's going to change your whole lifestyle. So Paul says, make sure your lifestyle suits the gospel. Reason number seven, because we're preoccupied with other things. We read about the enemies of the cross of Christ, and one of their characteristics in Philippians 3 is that they mind earthly things. It's not necessarily evil things. We've just allowed ourselves to be distracted. I'm sorry, I was just too busy. I had all this to-do list of stuff that won't matter a snap of the fingers a hundred years from now. And we let these important things slip by because we're just too busy. If you're too busy to witness, you're too busy. And we need to ask the Lord to order our day so that we do have opportunities. A divided heart is a dangerous heart. And I'll never forget a brother telling me that he was involved in fundraising for one of the political parties and uh, that he didn't witness because he was afraid it would undermine his fundraising. And when he finally was convicted and he gave up his post, they asked him if he would take 
a major donor to the airport as sort of his last act in his position. And he agreed to do it. He said, you know, when we started off in the car, for the first time in my life, I felt the joy of an undivided heart. I wasn't afraid now of how this would adversely affect my fundraising. And for the first time, though I'd known this man for years, first time in my life I shared the gospel with him. So it's really crucial that we have an undivided heart, that we're totally committed to the idea that when I wake up in the morning, what am I doing here? I'm here as a witness. I'm here on a mission. I'm not here to make money. I'm not here to have a good time, to enjoy myself. I'm here as a representative, as an ambassador for God, and I'm to speak as if God were pleading through me. Reason eight, I've never been shown how. You know, maybe that's true. Uh, there are tactics and there are good verses to use and so on, but I think that's kind of a lame excuse myself. A young believer said to me, if we talk to God every day, and we talk to people every day. What's so hard about talking to God about people and talking to people about God? And uh, I think out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. And there are a lot of people saying, oh, it's too tough to talk about the gospel, but they don't find it too tough to talk about politics or the weather or cars or sports. That's because that's what their heart's full of. If you're sitting there sucking all that stuff in, it's gonna come out. And so our heart is, indexed by our tongue. In other words, we know what's in our heart based on what comes out of our mouth. And if our heart is full of Christ and the enjoyment of Christ and the love of Christ, it's going to come out. Yeah, there are good tactics to learn along the way, but the best way to learn how to witness is to witness. You know, a lot of people, they'd much rather go to a seminar on witnessing than actually go out and do it. But it's the best way to share the gospel when we get out and witness. Number nine, I'm afraid of looking stupid because I might not have the answers. That kept me back for a long time, and I came to realize it. You know, uh, it's good to find good answers, and, you know, we should only be stumped once on a question. If we don't know the answer, well, then go find it. So the next time you're asked, you will have an answer. But, you know, it's good to be able to say that the Lord is a very present help. I'm going into battle not on my own. The Spirit of God is there. He can bring scriptures to my mind. He can give me answers to questions I've never thought about before. But realize the man born blind. He had these theologians that wanted to argue with him, and he just said, look, gentlemen, one thing I know. I was blind, now I see. So if somebody brings up a question and you don't know the answer to it, I can answer that in three words. I don't know. <laughs> right? But here's something I do know. People don't expect you to know everything, but they do expect you to be honest with them. And so if you try to wing it, try to fake it, it's like, eh, you know, that's not working. And of course, this allows for an opportunity for an ongoing conversation. And you say, that's a good question. You know what? I've never thought of that. Uh, let me look it up and I'll get back to you. And so actually they'll see the honesty. I remember two fellows uh, at a General Motors plant, they talked to a young Christian and they asked them some Bible questions. And he said, well, I'll, I'll call up some preacher friends and find out the answer. And they said, look, if this doesn't mean enough to you to look it up for yourself, we don't want to know the answer. They were really testing him as to how serious he was. So I think it's really important for us that we be ready to give an answer, but at the same time, we're not going to know all the answers. But the important thing to realize is, by the time I do know all the answers, <laughs> there won't be anybody to witness to. I'll be in heaven. So the Lord is willing to use flawed instruments for his glory. He knows we're weak, and God has actually chosen people who are not eloquent. So that when the gospel accomplishes his work, we'll all know who did it. Finally, number 10, fear of rejection. Yes, this actually isn't number 10. This is actually number one. This is the number one reason that people don't witness, fear of rejection. You know, we wouldn't worry what people thought about us if we realized how little they did. 
They're, they're not spending the day thinking about their engagement with us. But the word of God, if I speak it, will take hold in their mind. What they think about me doesn't matter a snap of the fingers. What they think about Jesus, it will affect their eternal destiny. So Proverbs 29, 25 is a well-known verse. The fear of man brings a snare, but whoever puts his trust in the Lord shall be safe. Whoever I talk to today, whether powerful or weak, whether rich or poor, they're all just poor sinners desperately in need of a Savior. I've engaged with Christ. I've met with him in the morning, the most wonderful person in the universe, and he's commissioned me. I'm not doing this on my own initiative. This wasn't my idea. He's asked me to do this. And if he's asked me to do, if I can catch that in my own heart, the Lord Jesus personally wants me to do this. And as I shared with a friend, if in the morning I would commit myself to asking the Lord to arrange an opportunity, an open door for the gospel, and give me a good verse to share with someone, and and if he brings someone to my mind to pray for them, so that when I meet them, I can legitimately say to them, I prayed for you this morning. God brought you to my mind, and he gave you a message from the Bible. Would you like to know what it is? So that this is real. They understand I'm in communication with God. He spoke to me. I spoke to him. And you were the subject of the conversation. It's a very powerful thing. And especially when I pray with people, some of them have never heard their name mentioned in prayer. And all of a sudden they realize, like, this isn't just this guy's opinion. God is speaking to me. And it will have a very powerful effect. So we can have lots of what we call reasons for not witnessing. But there are some crucial reasons that we need to. We believe in hell. We believe in the judgment. We believe that the Lord is coming back. We believe that no man can boast for today whether he'll be alive tomorrow. We believe these things and we need to lay hold of the gospel so that it brings joy to our own heart. And then in an overflow of joy, we share it with others around us.